Thank you uh, all for coming. I know you really would like to be on your bicycles, but fortunately, the rain has brought you in here. So um, I'm very grateful for your presence. And it is truly um, a very humbling experience when I, we, we brought the program uh, that many of the, so many experts and su such uh, volumes of, of scholarship that, um, uh, that these people here produce, and many of them were participants and lived through uh, the events we will discuss. Uh, all through, uh, through this day. We cannot escape history, said Abraham Lincoln a month before signing the Ep Emancipation Proclamation. Or in Desmond Tutu's words, some pasts refuse to lie down quietly. Indeed, no nation is comprised of only the glorious and the heroic. And if such story is told, that's nothing but imagined past. For all nations have dark parts of their pasts and often even skeletons in their closets, including the real ones. As historian Margaret Macmillan uh, said, we can still have heroes, but we have to accept that in history, as in our own lives, very little is absolutely black and absolutely white. And just as in our own lives, it's difficult for nations, religious institutions, and other groups to acknowledge those less glorious parts of our lives and pasts. It is particularly difficult to do so when history becomes uh, politicized and mythologized, when it is manipulated for political reasons. For history is as much about remembering uh, the past as about forgetting. And the manipulation is about what is remembered and what is forgotten. Such is not just bad history, but it is also a dangerous history, which sooner or later will present its bill. After World War II, many European countries engaged, engaged in what some scholars dubbed collective amnesia, or even rewriting of the past. Austria, for example, began to redefine itself as the first victim of the Nazis. France amplified the resistance. And Western Germany, after trials of some high-profile Nazi leaders, allowed for silence to prevail. Poland, under communist rule, also chose to mute and forget certain parts of its past, resulting in the creation of the so-called white stains, or in Polish, Białe Plamy Historii, which covered the Katyn massacre, the September 11th, uh, I'm sorry, September 17th, 1939, ribbentrop morotov agreement to divide Poland, and also the discussion about the murder of Jews in Poland. While Nazi death camps were inescapable, as was the memory of World War II, which was ever present in the landscape, in schools, and on TV under communist regime, the Nazi crimes were internationalized, highlighting countries of citizenship of the victims, rarely mentioning that Jews were the primary or the majority of the victims of many of the death camps. This phenomenon, however, was not just limited to Poland. Already in August 1945, the so-called Nuremberg Charter that set guidelines for the prosecution of Nazi officials in Nuremberg defined three categories of crimes. Crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Poland's Jewish survivors helped gather evidence against Nazis documenting the destruction of Jews in Europe, but the framing around much more generally conceived crimes against humanity set the international precedent for obscuring the specific character of what happened to Jews during the war. It also gave, gave cover to European countries, including France or, or Poland, which could now focus on presenting more general human devastation of the world as Nazi or in Poland Hitler, Hitlerovsi or Hitlerite crimes um, against humanities, without specifying the Nazi obsession with Jews. For decades then, 
Poles and post-World War II have been told about six million Polish victims and the na uh, of the Nazis, the number that was set in the 1947 report. So when in the late 1980s, the discussions began to note large number of, of Jews among these victims, breaking the numbers into three million of Jews uh, of, uh, or 90% of pre-war uh, pre Polish Jewish population and some two million Pol Poles and, uh, and additional hundreds of thousands or million other ethnicities, it felt like Polish suffering was being diminished and the competition in suffering began to be more pronounced. History was again politicized to defend the, ha the now deeply rooted collective memory afflicted by an earlier amnesia. An amnesia that was periodically challenged through books and film. Still, as the collective memory was challenged, both sideism and false symmetries insensitive to historical context and the differences between the Polish and Jewish war experiences began to be heard. Such politicization of history did not end with the communist regime. In fact, politicization, though in a mirror image, began soon after the end of the communist rule when the pent-up hatred of the regime was manifested in the focus on an amplification of the communist crimes. Now the crimes of two regimes helped shield Poles from facing their own agency in his, as historical actors rather than passive victims of observers of historical events brought about by the Nazi and the communist regimes. But the focus on the Nazi era or even Nazi crimes began to recede from focus. The December 1998 Act of the Institute on National Remembrance established a commission on, for the prosecution of crimes against the Polish nation. This is the same law whose revisions arose controversy last year in November 2018 and led us to uh, organize this series in dialogue on Polish -Jewish relations, um, in Polish-Jewish relations to unpack the complex and compellingly textured shared Polish-Jewish past, a centuries-old past that does not neatly fit into ideological categories but a past that is so vulnerable to politicization and abuse. And by the way, the revision of the law um, uh, that created such an uproar also um, did not just upset the uh, people involved in Jewish research, but also Ukrainians, because the Article 2 was revised to include uh, the role of Ukrainians in the uh, atrocities. But let's return to the 1998 original act. The preamble of the act mentioned um, the enormity and the, uh, the, the number of victims, the losses and damages su suffered by the Polish people during World War II and after it ended. It mentioned the patriotic tradition of the struggle of the Polish people against occupiers, the Nazism and communism, and echoed um, the language and of the Nuremberg Charter, the obligation to prosecute the crimes against peace and humanity and war crimes. But examined closely, it is clear that the Institute of National Remembrance Act was primarily aimed at the communist era with Nazi, crime, Nazi era crimes only as an add-on, but not of central interest. The language and the parameters cannot be clearer. Article one stated that the act regulates the recording, collecting, storing, processing, securing, making available and publishing of documents of the state security authorities produced and accumulated from July 22, 1944 until July 31, 1990, as well as the documents of the security authorities of the Third Reich and the Soviet Union relating the Nazi, com the communist, and other crimes against peace, humanity, or war crimes perpetrators on, Pol uh, on persons of Polish nationality or Polish citizens of other nationalities between November 8, 1917 
until July 31st, 1990. In fact, the word Nazi appears only twice, Third Reich also only twice, but the phrase communist appears 10 times, including the phrase communist crimes uh, appearing five times. In fact, Article 2 of this original act is devoted in full to communist crimes. No separate article devoted to Nazi crimes exists in this document at all. The dates are significant as well. They too signal the primary focus on communism, July 22, 1944 and November 8, 1917. 1944 appears 10 times in the act. 1939, the beginning of Nazi occupation, only twice. At our last session, someone asked, when did the attention shift away from Nazi crimes? I think one place to look is in the po post-communist approach to the past. The Institute of National Remembrance Act in which a pent-up energy for the communist rule shifted its gaze away from World War II and atrocities committed then, played a major role. In post-communist Poland, history began to be politicized again, but in a different direction, in, a, in creating a new collective memory that emphasized actions performed by the officers of the communist state who were defined as public functionary, as well as a person who granted equal protection to that of a public functionary, in a particular, a public park functionary and a person who performed executive functions within the statutory body of, a, of the communist parties. The shift away from Nazi era crimes to communist crimes prepared the ground for the revival of the anti-Semitic trope of Ju Judeo-Communism, or Judo-Communa, which emerged soon after the October Revolution, but which became deployed in Polish nationalist propaganda as early as 1918, and perhaps even earlier. And the myth then gained power thanks to the Nazi propaganda fanning fears of Judeo-Bolshevism. And then in, 19, in the 1940s in Poland with anti-communist opposition. In fact, in post-World War II, Poles played, uh, played, um, the role Poles played in the communist regime has been minimized or explained away uh, at the expense of Jews. Um, an average poll, as Bishop Czesław Kaczmarek of Kielce noted in his report after the Kielce pogrom, thinks, whether it is accurate or inaccurate, that among the only true and sincere supporters of communists in Poland are primarily Jews. Because the vast majority of communist Poles are, according to this general opinion, only opportunists, without ideology who are communists only because it's worth for them. And I know we'll hear more about it uh, later today, but this obsession with communism, along with the trope of Judeo-communism, or Judo Comuna, has been, in my mind, a major stumbling block in real reconciliation and real efforts to face the past. Nazi occupation, the communist rule, and anti-communists have effect, uh, communism have effectively become shields preventing the real exploration of the shared Polish Jewish past. This inability to deal with the past fed into narratives based in myths and counter myths embraced by, uh, by, by, by uh, Poles and, um, and, uh, and Jews. And here you have the, the two uh, myths we discussed in the very first session. Both of those myths, and uh, the myth and counter myth, paradoxically reach the same false conclusion of alienation of Jews from Poland and of and Polish society and culture. This conclusion was like a curing balm after the Shoah. For Jews, it helped explain to them why their Polish neighbors often stood by or worse participated in murders. For Poles, it helped to see the destruction of Polish Jews as a distinct experience, a separate part of World War II, disconnected from the Polish experience. And in fact, even the idea of bystanders, problematic as it was, 
also has served to reinforce the narrative of separate pasts, of Jews as victims of Nazis and of Poles observing from a distance also as victims of Nazis. The result then became that Polish-Jewish relations have often been discussed in the realm of emotions and stereotypes. In this series, we have tried to complicate and unpack uh, some of these stories. This is what historians do. They often, as historian Michael Howard said, explode national myths. It is a task filled with landmines for challenging comfortable assumptions about the collective past, and it is painful. But it is also a mark of maturity. It is perhaps telling that lawmakers in post-communist Poland chose to create an institute, not an institute of national history, but an institute of national remembrance. But it is not through myth and memory that we can find reconciliation. Memory tends to oversimplify the past, idealize it, clean it, provide narratives that seek to justify what happened, good or bad. Memory tends to address the emotions. History, on the other hand, I think may provide a way out. As historian Elliot Gorn poignantly said, history comprises of knowledge of painful things, painfully arrived at. Memory, notions of the past that flatter us with easy myths and sometimes cheap emotions. Historians, he argued, occupy a tiny space where richness of the past is kept alive, where competing voices can still be heard. One of the most important things historians do is to bear witness to the past, including its horrors, in order to battle amnesia that would sweep away all the difficult and the repugnant. And if there is a model for a way out and facing and overcoming the painful past, it is, I believe, Jewish-Catholic reconciliation. It was an honest look uh, at the past, though accurate, through accurate studies and uh, after centuries of animosities, even violence, it helped the two communities to join in a friendship, sometimes difficult, and in a dialogue. As, as Archbishop uh, Stanisław Gondecki noticed, um, the dialogue with Judaism required a lot of courage. Its commandment was a rule, do not be afraid of difficult dialogue in which we will discuss respectful of the truth and in the spirit of kindness, difficult matters. A dialogue in which a path to accord leads at times through contention. This for me is a model to follow for Polish-Jewish dialogue. As Archbishop Gondecki uh, also said, Polish-Jewish dialogue is, a, is Poland's dialogue with its own identity. As such, it demands an honest look at the, uh, at the past as a shared history in, its, in all its colors. Not as a Polish history or a Jewish history, but a shared history. Such an honest approach as historian Mac Margaret MacMillan noted, can only be healthy for societies struggling to deal with past horrors. And I hope you'll join us today in this spirit to explore this, this period, difficult past, and that shared history. Thank you.